I thought I would tell you a bit about some of the tools we've been developing for compressing a distribution more effectively than IID sampling or standard MCMC, Markov Chain Monte Carlo thinning. And this is joint work with a lot of great people, including I think Roz, who should be here somewhere. And so the motivation for this work for me came from the field of computational cardiology. Um, some of my collaborators work in this field and they're developing these multi-scale digital twins of human hearts. And the idea is that if I can simulate your heart, then I can understand what a therapy is going to do to you without having to you know, cut you open and give you that therapy. And this is necessarily a multi-scale sort of process. So to simulate a heart, you need to understand what's happening even at the single cell level. And so here's an example that people are interested in studying. It's what's the relationship between um, uh, calcium signaling and irregular heartbeats, which are called arrhythmias. And so these whole organ heartbeats we know are coordinate, coordinated by calcium signaling in your cells. And we know that dysregulation can lead to life-threatening heart disease like heart arrhythmias. And so there's this whole field dedicated to modeling the impact of calcium signaling dysregulation on the beating of your heart. And let's think about what this looks like from an inferential standpoint, okay? So first, um, for a patient, you need to um, estimate the unknown parameters in calcium signaling. So we have models of how calcium signaling works, but they have unknown parameters. We have to fit that to patient data. Now that we have estimation, we also have uncertainty. So we need some way to capture that uncertainty. A typical way to do that in this field is to sample many likely parameter configurations, usually using Markov chain Monte Carlo or MCMC for short. So you're trying to sample from the posterior distribution over those unknown parameters given your patient data. At this point, you're typically gonna sample millions of sample points because it's a complex posterior. You're trying to get your Markov chain to mix to that posterior distribution, so you get these long chains. Okay, so that gives you uncertainty about your single cell calcium signaling parameters, but what you actually care about is the heart. We wanna know what's going to happen to your heart under all of these different parameter configurations. So for each of those sampled points, you wanna simulate a heart. And that's where things really get expensive. In this case, each heart simulation costs thousands of CPU hours. All right, and so now you have millions of points, thousands of CPU hours, it's too many hours, you'd like to reduce. And so this question that they posed to me and my collaborators was, can we accurately summarize this distribution P using many fewer points, maybe a thousand points instead of a million? And if so, how do you do that? And so this is the goal that underlies what I like to call distribution compression. That is accurately summarize a distribution P using a small number of points. And there, I think you're all actually familiar with some standard solutions to this problem. A, a pretty common one is just to directly sample from P over and over again, IID sampling from P. If you can't do that, you could use Markov chain Monte Carlo. You can run a Markov chain that will eventually converge to your target distribution and then use the iterates of that chain as your approximation. And the benefits of these approaches is that they're readily available. So you, and they're readily available and they're eventually high quality. So you can, you can I don't know what these buttons do. You can eventually approximate these intractable expectations, often these integrals in red, with sample averages that are asymptotically exact. So that's a good thing. But on the other hand, the samples actually are pretty large. They're pretty bloated. Your typical integration error is going down like n to the minus one half, which means that to get 1% relative error, you need 10,000 points. And that sort of n to the minus one half blow up is pretty expensive for these downstream tasks. Um, where we have these expensive function evaluations like heart simulations. So here's an idea. What if we start with these readily available high quality approximations that you get from MCMC and then try to compress that, try to compress one of those empirical distributions, PN, instead of trying to compress the original distribution P. All right, well, that's just another distribution compression problem. And so how do we effectively compress an empirical distribution? And you could reach for some of the same tools. You could do uniform subsampling over your points. You could do IID sampling from the empirical distribution. In MCMC, we typically do something which I'll call standard thinning, which is just keep every teeth point from your sample. And the problem with this is that you get a large loss in accuracy. So your worst case, your worst case integration error typically grows like square root T over N, which means if you want to do heavy compression, like from N points down to square root N, your error is blowing up to all the way to n to the minus one quarter. So you had this good n to the minus one half approximation. Now you're blowing it up to n to the minus one quarter. And that's a big that's a big hit to take. So 
a question that naturally arises, can we do better than that? Well, to, to understand this, it help, it's helpful to look at the minimax lower bounds for this problem. And we know a few things. First, we know that for any compression procedure that returns square root endpoints, it has to suffer at least n to the minus one half error for some distribution. And we also know that for any approximation to p whatsoever, if it's only based on n iid points, then again, it has to suffer n to the minus one half error for some distribution. Okay, so these are both n to the minus one half. That's a lot better than the n to the minus one quarter. In fact, that's the quality that we started with when we we're just using pn. If we didn't do any compression, we already had n to the minus one half. So that suggests maybe there's some more room for improvement. There are even special cases where we know a lot more. For instance, in the case of when your target distribution is specifically the uniform distribution on the unit cube in D dimensions, we know from the field of quasi Monte Carlo, where this sort of thing is studied um, quite a lot, that the best you can do is n to the minus one half times this log factor that blows up with the dimension. And in fact, we don't just know a lower bound there, we actually have upper bounds. There are constructions that work for that case. Okay, but that's just for this uniform distribution um, on the unit cube. What about non uniform distributions? What about unbounded distribution, what can we do there? So the first part of this talk is going to be, to, is going to be about introducing a practical compression strategy, we call it kernel thinning, that will match these lower bounds up to log factors, even for non-uniform and unbounded P. Okay, so here's our setup. You're gonna be given a set of input points, X1 through Xn, they're gonna be an R to the D. And we're gonna call the empirical distribution PN. And I'm not gonna say a lot about these input points. They can really come from anywhere. They can be pre-generated by any algorithm. They could be IID samples. They could come from a Markov chain. They could even come from a quadrature rule or, for, or a deterministic procedure like kernel herding. We don't care where they came from. What we care about is that they, together they provide a good approximation to P, all right? Because you're using that as your input. Then you have a target output size, S. You can think about S being about square root N if you wanna do heavy compression. And your goal is to return a core set, we'll call that S out, that has S points in it. So you wanna return a subset of your input sequence with S points. We'll call the empirical distribution over that subset Q. And our goal is for us to have better than IID integration error. Okay, so IID integration error would give us S to the minus one half. We wanna be able to do better than that. We wanna get little o of S to the minus one half. Okay. So, that's our goal, better than IID worst case integration error. What do I mean by worst case integration error? I'm glad you asked. We're going to use a particular quality measure to, to, to gauge the quality of your, your integration error. This is called the maximum mean discrepancy, the kernel maximum mean discrepancy. It, it literally measures the maximum discrepancy between your input and core set expectations over a class of test functions. In this case, the test functions are coming from a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So it's parameterized by a kernel K. What's a kernel function with two arguments, symmetric in those two arguments? It's also positive semi-definite. So if you form the matrix of pairwise evaluations, that's always going to be a positive semi-definite matrix. Here are two common examples, a Gaussian kernel, looks like a Gaussian density, evaluated at x minus y. Here's inverse multi-quadric, similar, but except it has a polynomial decay instead. Question, is there any reason to use uniform weights for Q? Not particularly. It, it doesn't have, it, it need not be. And we'll come back to, I'll say a little bit about that toward the end, but yeah, it doesn't have to be. But the construction I'm gonna give you will be uniform. And if you make it non-uniform, it will just get better from there. And so I'll tell you something about the quality of the uniform set, but then clearly empirically, you get a gain from the reweighting. And there's a trade-off between runtime and um, quality there, because it costs more to reweight than to get the, to get the unweighted set. But, um, and, there are some open questions related to like, what is the gain of that weighting? How much, do you, how much do you gain by doing that extra weighting? Yeah. But yeah, we don't have to, we don't have to restrict ourselves to uniform weights, but I'm going to do that for now and we'll see what that takes place. And I just want to highlight a few things about these MMDs. Um, if you pick your kernel in the right way, for instance, if you pick a Gaussian kernel or an inverse multi-quadric, this actually metrizes convergence and distribution. So even though explicitly you're controlling integration error over the unit ball of this reproducing kernel Hilbert space, you're actually controlling integration error for any bounded continuous function. Okay, so we need one more element for me to actually explain this algorithm to you, this kernel thinning algorithm, and that's what we call a square root kernel. 
A square root kernel is a kernel that when you integrate it against itself, gives you back the, another kernel. Um, so if you, your target kernel is k, the square root kernel is this k root that in, when you integrate against itself, gives you back k. And it turns out these are pretty easy to find for lots of common kernels. So for Gaussian, a square root kernel is just another Gaussian with a different bandwidth. Same thing for Matern, it's a different Matern with a different parameter. For a B-spline kernel, it's another B-spline. Okay, and so you might ask, like, why are we looking at the square root kernels? Well, one of the results from our work says that you can actually reduce the problem of finding a good MMD core set for your target kernel K to one of finding a good L infinity core set for a square root kernel. That is, you want to find a core set with empirical measure Q such that the kernel means um, are small in the worst case. The difference between kernel means between the input and the output is small in the worst case. In particular, if you're um, if you're dealing with a compactly supported distribution, a compactly supported kernel, then whatever rate you get for the square root kernel translates into your MMD rate for the target. When you move into heavier tails, when you get to like sub-exponential distributions, you start to get these log factors that are reminiscent of what you see in quasi Monte Carlo. All right, so that's why we're even considering the square root kernel. And it tells us that, okay, now we should be thinking about forming a good core set for the square root kernel in terms of L infinity error. So how do you do that? Well, here's an algorithm we call it kernel thinning. It has two steps. The first step is an initialization stage. We call it KT split. And what you're going to do is you're going to take your input points, x1 through xn, we're going to call that F S in, and you're going to recursively divide, it, divide them in half. You start with n points, you're going to throw away half of them, you get to n over two, throw away half, get to n over four, all the way down to your target size and out. And so how does each of those having steps work? I'm going to dig into this what one of these having layers looks like. All right, so this is kernel having. How do we get from n points to n over two points? So our goal now is to split the input into two balanced core sets of equal size. What do I mean by balance here? I mean that I want the kernel means on, the, on each half. You know, one, if you're splitting the two sides, you get two core sets. You want the two core set means to be similar, to be close to each other. And that's actually equivalent to saying, that each core set mean is, is um, similar to the overall input mean. All right, so how can you do that? Well, if you just picked half of them at random, uniformly at random, you'd get an error that looks like one over square root n. That's the sort of the typical sort of IID error. We're getting n over two points. You can think of it one over square root n over two. That's the sort of error you'll get. And so we want to do better than that. And so how are we going to do better? Well, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to check for balance before assigning points to core sets. So we're gonna do this in an online way. We're gonna consider two points at a time and we're gonna choose just one of those two to keep in one core set. And we're gonna use a, what we, it's a new Hilbert space generalization of this beautiful algorithm due to Aylweiss, Liu, and Sani called the self-balancing walk. So you start out with empty core sets, S and S primed. You're getting points coming in two at a time, X1, X2, X3, X4, and so on. And what you're going to do is you're going to try adding the points to these core sets. So I'll try to add x to, the, to s, x prime to s prime, and I'm going to measure the balance. I'm going to measure how different they are here specifically in the MMD norm with respect to k root. And then I'm going to flip them around and try the other way, and I'm going to measure the balance again. And then I'm going to flip a coin, and this coin is going to be biased toward the, um, the more balanced option. Okay, And it turns out that's enough to make a difference. That's enough to take this one over square root n error and turn it into this square root d log n over n. And so this is where a lot of the gain, a lot of the difference between square root n and n is going to come up. We get this, you have this extra log n factor, but that's the translation you get by doing this checking before assignment. Okay. So that's just, but that's just one round, right? So that takes me from n to n over two. So what do you do then? Well, you basically just recurse. You're going to recursively apply this. Turns out if you do this, if you, if you combine the bounds that we just mentioned in the last pit on the, the last slide with this relationship between square root kernel balancing and target kernel balancing, then you get these sorts of guarantees out for the final MMD. It says that if you're dealing with compactly supported distributions and kernels, your, your overall MMD is going to be square root log n over n. And if you have these sub-exponential sub, sub tails, then you get these extra log factors reminiscent of these quasi Monte Carlo guarantees. And you can compare this with, with what you would get from IID sampling 
which would be in this case n to the minus one quarter. So this is if if I'm returning square root n points, these are the rates that you get. So I do the compression from n down to square root n. Okay, that's actually only step one though. So what did we do there? So I showed you how you construct a KT split core set, but actually I'm not just generating one core set, I'm actually partitioning your input points into a bunch of different candidate core sets, all using that same algorithm, but you do that all at once. So now I have a bunch of candidate core sets. If your target size is square root n, I have square root n of them. So now in the second step, KT swap, we're going to refine. First, we're gonna pick the best of those candidates. We're just gonna measure the error of each of those candidates to the input and pick the best one in terms of MMD. And then we're going to iteratively refine that core set by swapping out each point. So I'm going to try to replace each point with one of the input points and see if it leads to a better MMD. If it does, I'll keep it and I'll keep going. So it is greedy optimization on the MMD. Okay, that's it, that's the algorithm. The time complexity of both steps actually is dominated by having to form these n squared kernel evaluations between pairs of input points. It turns out, and I won't have time to tell you much more about it because of the time constraints today, but it turns out there's a wrapper algorithm um, that we've developed that you can use to, turn, to speed up your favorite thinning algorithm. So if your thinning algorithm runs in, square, in n squared time, you can reduce that to n log cube n time and only suffer at most a factor of four in the error of the output. And so you know, if you run the same algorithm through compressed plus plus, we call it, you can get that n squared down to n log cubed n. And the space on complexity is the maximum of n squared, or the minimum of n squared if you store your whole kernel matrix, or just nd, which is your data set size. Um, again, you can reduce that using this compressed plus plus algorithm. Okay, so that's the algorithm. I want to show you a very simple example just to elucidate some of the some of the properties of it of the algorithm. So here, your target is just a mixture of Gaussians. I've, I've drawn the contours of the target, and on the top, I'm showing you IID samples from a mixture of Gaussians, and on the bottom, I'm showing you a sample of equal size gotten via kernel thinning. And what do you see? So you see a couple of things. Um, First, when your sample size is small, if you're just sampling randomly, you tend to oversample some modes and undersample other ones. So you miss pretty big important components of the distribution. But if you do kernel thinning and you essentially oversample and then subselect, you hit those modes. And you're, you basically pick one point on each mode that gives you the best approximation. Then as you get to bigger and bigger sample sizes, what you typically see is you get less clumping and fewer big gaps in your distribution because you, know, you have the opportunity to pick the best points out of a larger set. OK, and that was a picture. You can also measure these differences. So you can actually measure the MMD between your target and your input. That's what I'm showing you here. And you see, well, as advertised, you're getting this improved rate of decay. From IID sampling is what you see in red. So that's giving you the n to the minus 1 quarter error if you're thinning from n to square root n points. If you're using kernel thinning here, you're basically getting n to the minus 1 half error because you're, uh, well, for the reasons I mentioned earlier. But I want to highlight that you're not just getting an improved rate of decay, but you're actually also getting an improved order of magnitude of the MMD, even for very small sample sizes. Like here, you're sampling four points, but you're already seeing the gap between um, IID sampling and, and doing this kernel thinning. All right, and that's all in two dimensions. But we saw that you know in higher dimensions, there are going to be these D factors. Let's see what the impact of that is. So here we've run the same sort of experiment. Back here was a mixture of Gaussians. Here's just a, a standard Gaussian in D dimensions um, and dimension two up to dimension 100. And you might think, oh, we have all those log factors with D. This is not going to work in dimension 100. But what we find is that even in, 100, in dimension 100, we're still seeing this improved rate of decay and um, improved orders of magnitude, even when you're dealing with a small number of points, like eight points here. Okay. All right, so that was, those are all simple examples targeting Gaussians. You know, you kind of know how to do that already. Let's think about posterior inference. That was the motivating example, right? So we're gonna think about our target distributions P are now gonna be posterior distributions over the unknown parameters of a system of coupled ordinary differential equations. All right, and we'll, we'll consider a few different models. There's this Goodwin model of oscillatory enzymatic control. That's a four-dimensional posterior. There's this Latka Volterra model of predator prey evolution. That's another four dimensional posterior. And then finally, there's this Hinch model of cardiac calcium signaling. That's the model that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk. Remember, here, our downstream goal is to be able to compress our sample so that we can reduce the running time of 
um, our heart simulation. So in this case, every sample point, that means a thousand CPU hours were saved. All right, so we're gonna evaluate each of these models and we're gonna do it using a number of different Markov chain Monte Carlo and target the posteriors of each of these models. And then we'll, we'll, we'll analyze four different algorithms. So there's a Gaussian random walk. There's an adaptive random walk. Um, there's a metropolis adjusted Langevin algorithm called MALA and a preconditioned version of that. And just to give you an idea of time scales here, just generating the Gaussian random walk chain for this um, hinge model posterior took us two weeks and generated a sample of size of length 4 million. All right, so now that running time, you know, generation was a long time. It's even longer if you try to run this through your simulator. And so the time we're spending doing the compression is basically negligible compared to all of that. Okay, so let's, we're gonna use a Gaussian kernel. So here's some plots. Um, every row represents a different posterior and every column represents a different sample, a different MCMC sample. So let's look first at the, the, the Goodwin and Laka at the top. What are we seeing in those two cases? There we're seeing that if we just use standard thinning, standard thinning is I just take every teeth point from my chain and I throw away the, the rest. So I'm thinning from N down to square root N. And if we just do standard thinning, you see we're getting error rates that in some cases are like a little bit worse than and to the minus one, uh, minus one quarter. Um, but you know, they're, they're slow. And if instead you use kernel thinning, you're basically getting n to the minus one half rates of convergence, which is like what we're hoping to see. So that's good. And we're doing this for different chains, you know, random walk, mala, et cetera. On the bottom, we have the hinge cardiac example. And something interesting happens here. The standard thinning is already doing pretty well. You're already seeing like n to the minus 0.4, minus 0.45, just from doing standard thinning. But even in that case, we're still, in see, we're still seeing these improved rates of decay and these improved orders of magnitude from doing kernel thinning. For instance, here, you're achieving the same level of error with half as many points, which means you know, half as many simu expensive simulations that you need to do. So that's good. So that's what we set out to do. You know, There's a problem, we solved it, and we could, <laughs> we could leave. But, but something's actually wrong. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong with that lax picture that you can't actually really see from this picture. So I'll have to tell you about it. What's wrong is that the hinge, so in the first two cases, Goodwin and Latka, we ran all sorts of standard diagnostics. We can see that the chains are mixing pretty well. But these hinge chains, the cardiac case, these hinge chains actually haven't mixed. And how do we know that? Well, we actually ran two independent Markov chains and they both, you know, ran them both for four to get 4 million points. And then we plotted, and remember, this is a, what, 36, 38 dimensional posterior distribution, so we can't plot that, but I'm plotting the, the marginals, the marginal distributions over single parameters. And, you know, we have two, now I have two samples, they're supposed to represent the same distribution. And so if I plot their marginals, they should at least be, you know, close to each other, on top of, ideally on top of each other, right? But look, these are like basically non-overlapping um, for a number of these marginal, these marginal distributions, which means that the two chains are basically exploring different local modes of the distribution and you haven't, you haven't mixed to the target. It's a standard sign. So what do you do? Because you know, we've been relying on the MCMC sample as our surrogate for P this whole time. And this is saying that that's a bad surrogate. So what do we do? Well, a typical thing to do in this case is you can use a more diffuse tempered posterior. We'll call it P tilde. Instead of targeting P with a Markov chain, we're gonna target P tilde. That will give us faster mixing. And so we can get a chain that's actually going to mix in a reasonable amount of time. Fine, that we can do that, and we will do that. But that's going to introduce another, a whole new problem. And that's because tempering, well, that's what this is called, tempering. Tempering in introduces a persistent bias. Now our, our chain is going to mix, but it's going to mix to the wrong distribution. It's going to mix to P tilde instead of P. And so how do we do inference with that? So here's a, a natural question you might ask. Well, since we're doing this compression anyway, can we correct for those biases while we're doing compression? And you know, there are other cases where you might care about this sort of thing. I mean, if you're doing tempering, certainly, but there are lots of other cases where you do off-target sampling. When you're in important sampling contexts, when you're using an approximate MCMC algorithm because it's much cheaper to run than a, you know, an, an exact MCMC algorithm that will actually converge, that, that can introduce a persistent bias. You even see this sort of bias when, uh, from Burnin, 
you know, when you mark, when you start a Markov chain, you have to start it somewhere. Often you don't know exactly where the mode of your distribution is. You start it somewhere and you end up with this long tail of points where it's basically just trying to find this, trying to find the high density regions of your target. And then finally, once it gets there, then it starts exploring the target. And so ideally when you're doing your inference, you like to throw all these points away and that's called the burn-in problem. And, and since that's just an example of a bias that you have in your Markov chain output. So how do we get rid of these sorts of things? Well, the difficulty is that you can't just look at the chain anymore. You can't look at the chain's outputs anymore because you need to know something about P to know where, where Pn is wrong. So we need somehow a measure of distance to the true target P. Now, before we were using these MMDs and we we're specifically measuring the MMD between Pn and Q and we're essentially optimizing that. But now I'd like to say, let's just optimize for P directly. Why don't we just you know, find a sample that approximates P directly in MMD? And we'd like to do that, but there's a problem. And I think the problem is highlighted by this rewriting of the MMD. You can expectations of your kernel under different distributions. And taking expectations under the distribution Q is pretty easy. It's, it's just a sample, it's an empirical distribution. So expectation under P is hard. Like if we knew how to do that, we wouldn't be going through this whole sampling thing to begin with. We would just take the integrals to begin with. And so for most kernels, for most MMDs, we just don't know how to compute. We don't know how to compute the MMD. So yeah, that's what I said. Don't know how. Um, so what can you do? So here's one idea. What if you used a special kernel, a kernel that you knew a priori was mean zero under your target distribution P? If you could do that somehow, then you'd get rid of all these integrals under P because they would just all be zero. And you'd just be left with sample integral, sample, sample integration under Q. So you, we know how to do that. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, it turns out that this is exactly the idea underlying what's called a kernel Stein discrepancy. A kernel Stein discrepancy is just a special type of MMD where the kernel is selected to be mean zero under P a priori. So you already know, you know how to integrate it. The answer is zero. And here's a little, a little bit more detail about these kernel Stein discrepancies. Here's a common choice of kernel in that space. So here, you know, you're dealing with posterior distributions. Typically, you know something about that, the density of that distribution. Like, you know, it has a differentiable Lebesgue density. Typically, you don't know the normalizing constant. You don't know how to integrate under it, but you know something. And this kernel is constructed so it only uses a little bit of information about P. It uses the gradient of the log density which in particular doesn't depend on the normalizing constant. So it's something you could still compute even if you don't know the normalizing constant. And it turns out under a mild condition, whenever grad log P is integrable, this kernel has mean zero under P. And it always, you start by plugging in a base kernel and essentially you're applying an operator, a differential operator to each of the arguments. Okay, so this is, okay, potentially proposing it. This is, this is some discrepancy. This is a kernel that's mean zero. You could build an MMD around it. Um, what would you do with that? You, you know, you probably, most of you have never seen this before. You might say, why should I use that? Why should I trust that? Um, we've been trying to study its properties to understand why you might want to use it. Here's, um, oh yeah, it's Here's one result that we have along those lines. Basically, it says that KSD controls convergence and distribution. So I told you earlier that if you pick a standard Gaussian MMD or, or an inverse multi-quadric, that's going to control convergence and distribution. So you're controlling all, you know, bounded continuous expectations. The same thing is going to be true, true here for KSDs under some assumptions. Here are the assumptions. If you use as your base kernel, one of these inverse multi-quadric kernels shown here, and if your target has strongly log concave tails, so it doesn't need to be a log concave distribution. Um, it could even be actually be multimodal. So what goes on in the center of the distribution can be pretty, um, pretty varied, but you need the tails to be strongly log concave. Then, Whenever your sample sequence, so um, whenever your kernel Stein discrepancy converges to zero, you're guaranteed that your sample is converging weakly to P. Meaning in particular, you can control like the bounded Lipschitz distance using, using this metric. Okay, so we know something about it. What are we gonna do with it? So now that we have an MMD that's actually computable that measures distance directly to P or the target distribution, we're gonna pick our, our core set to optimize this MMD. We're gonna greedily optimize it. And so we're gonna start with an empty core set, no points. And then we're gonna add in points one by one. First, we're gonna pick the single point that gives us the best approximation to P in terms of this kernel Stein discrepancy. 
Then we're gonna go back and add another point and so on until we get to our target size. So it's just greedy optimization of the MMD. I will just highlight that you, you know, potentially you will choose the same point more than once. That's okay. That's kind of like introducing weighting into the point. So it's getting a little bit to the question we had earlier. That's okay. You can choose the same point more than once. The runtime overall in the worst case is going to be n s squared, where s is your target output size. So if again, if you're doing that heavy compression down to square root n points, you're again an n squared time algorithm. And okay, so what can we say about the quality of this algorithm? So here's a guarantee from our work. Um, it has two terms. We're bounding the MMD between the true distribution P now and your the core set produced by Stein thinning. We'll call this Stein thinning. It has two terms. And the second term is really no better than what you'll get from an IID core set. But this first term is actually something a bit more interesting. It's saying that before we were just comparing the quality of the core set to the quality that you would get from the input from PN. But this is actually comparing the quality to the best, re best simplex reweighted version of that core set. So it's saying the Stein thinning output is never much worse than the best reweighted version in the simplex of your input points. And that's, really, that's a really powerful statement because it means you're going to perform as well as your input with all the burn in removed. Because if you have this burn in chain, you could always assign all those points weights of zero and then give equal weights to these other points, and you're competing with that. But you didn't have to decide where the burn in was. It's all happening automatically, right? You didn't have to find the burn in. And it also means you can do nearly as well as an off target sample with optimal importance sampling reweighting, but without having to know what the important sample weights are or to compute them or anything. So we can dig into that to a little bit, a little bit more. Here's like a more precise statement. This says that imagine that your input is just an IID draw from the wrong distribution, P tilde. Okay, so I'm sampling from the wrong distribution a lot. I have tons of points in the wrong distribution. And then under some mild conditions, these are typical important sampling conditions. I grade them out so you didn't pay too much attention. Um, the, the Stein thinning output, <coughs> this core set you get out, is going to converge to the target distribution, even though you're sampling from the wrong distribution all along. And that's essentially saying you're competing with the best important sampled version of that input. And in the paper, we have our results for ergodic Markov chains instead of IID sampling as well. Okay, so let's see this in action. We have like a few minutes left before we just stop for questions. So let's see this in action. Um, first, let's look at what happens with burn in here. We're gonna look at the Goodwin model of um, oscillatory enzymatic control. This is a case where we started the Markov chain here. I'm showing you a projection into two dimensions. It's a four dimensional posterior, but this is just a projection of two of those dimensions. So you start your Markov chain here. It turns out the whole of the distribution is basically supported in this little box over here. So we actually spent about half of the chain just finding our way over to that box. And so all these points are completely useless for inference. And so what would you normally do? What you normally do um, in the setting is that you'd run a bunch of chains and you use them to figure out where the burn-in is. You try to figure out where they're meeting each other. And then based on that, you, you decide, okay, well, the burn-in, all this stuff is burn-in. I'll throw away all these points and I'll just keep these points. And then once I have those points, then I'll just use standard thinning to subsample them. And that will be my output. What you could do instead is you could take this whole long chain with the burn-in and just pass it into this Stein thinning procedure and just ask it to pick good points for you. And in that case, it just ends up picking these red points here. And it ends up, it doesn't pick any of these points because they're not actually useful for improving the MMD to your target distribution. And you have a direct measure of that already. And you can see that sort of gain also in different convergence diagnostics. So you could, you certainly see an improvement. So I'm comparing on the top, um, the grayish curves are just using standard thinning with burn-in removal. The black curve is using another compression procedure called support points. And the colored curves, so you can look at any of them, maybe like the blue one, colored curves are all different, different versions of the Stein thinning. And what you could do is you could measure, you know, how well does it optimize this KSD? Like what, what does your KSD look like over time? And you see improvements there. But you also see improvements in other metrics that are not being directly optimized, like the energy distance is a common one. Or you can just measure the absolute error to, in terms of if you try to estimate the first moment with the sample, how good is that estimate? So these are absolute error measurements. And again, you see some improvements from doing this thinning version instead of using the typical burn-in strategy. Okay, so that was the Goodwin model. What about this cardiac model? 
remember before I said we ran these chains and we knew that they weren't mixing well because when I looked at two uh, independent samples, they were basically non-overlapping and so they were getting stuck in local modes. So the whole purpose of this slide is just to say that if we use a tempered posterior instead, we, we basically are getting good mixing. We are seeing good overlap between independent samples. This is all just to like, you know, make you comfortable about that fact. So we have good mixing, but we have good mixing to the wrong distribution. And so we wanna correct for that. Okay, so how do we, how do we deal with this? Um, here's a plot where I'm showing you a few different things. First in black, I'm showing you what you get if you just um, compress your untempered chain. What's the quality of your inference if you compress the untempered chain? That's what this black curve is showing you. We're using a standard compression algorithm called support points. Um, we're just compressing um, this chain that hasn't mixed and the, the quality is very bad. And the quality is bad because it hasn't mixed yet. So you know, you're getting a good approximation to the, the input to the chain, but the chain is not a good approximation to P. So your quality is bad, okay. So what can you do instead? Instead, you could just run your, run your tempered chain and compress that directly. That's this gray line here. You actually do even worse in that case because now you know, the chain mix, it's a good representation of P tilde, but P tilde isn't P. So your compression again is really bad um, because of the wrong distribution. So finally, what, could you, what you could do is you could take these tempered points that have mixed well, and you can pass them through Stein thinning, which does bias correction while it's um, compressing. And then you get an increasingly good approximation to your true target P. And that's what we're hoping for. Okay, so conclusions. I presented a couple of new tools um, for summarizing a probability distribution more effectively than IID sampling or um, MCMC thinning, standard thinning. First, there was kernel thinning, which takes in an endpoint summary and spits out a squared endpoint summary that's about as good. Um, then there was Stein thinning, which does compression and um, bias correction simultaneously, when this is particularly good for tempering and um, approximate MCMC and burn-in removal. And finally, I hinted at this other algorithm, Compress++, plus plus, which you can use to speed up your thinning algorithm so you don't have to spend a quadratic time. You can do it in almost linear time. And if you want to learn more about any of that, here's some links and some code that you can use. And uh, thank you all so much for your time. <laughs>